Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual lecture this evening. Thank you for joining us at um, this virtual community fo lecture focused on postmenopausal bleeding. I'm Jane Neri, Executive Director of Surgery and Cardiovascular Services at Providence Little Company of Mary Torrance in San Pedro. This evening, we are joined by experts Dr. Jeff Lin from City of Hope, South Bay, and Dr. Denise Ishimaru from Providence Medical Associates. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that this is an hour long presentation and we will have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A box to type in any questions you have throughout the event and we will do our best to get to each question at the end of the presentations. We will not be opening it up for attendees to, attendees to speak at the, this webinar. Before I introduce our first speaker for the evening, I am so thrilled to share a bit about Providence Little Company of Mary's partnership with City of Hope. City of Hope has brought its expert clinicians and staff to the South Bay communities in partnership with Providence Little Company of Mary. Both organizations are working together to bring, bring unparalleled cancer care and innovative treatments closer to home. Our physicians and clinicians work closely together, sharing expert knowledge in implementing evidence-based clinical protocols critical to improving quality and affordability and enhancing our patients' experiences. This partnership has expanded access to comprehensive cancer care services in the South Bay in time of growing demand for oncology care. To learn more about this partnership, visit southbaycancercare.org. Again, that's SouthCare cancercare.org, and we will add that URL in the chat box for easy access. Lastly, I want our attendees to know that the information provided during this program is for educational purposes only. You should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding a medical condition or treatment. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Denise Ishimaru. Dr. Ishimaru was born in Santa Monica and raised in West Los Angeles and is a first generation physician. A family of teachers helped shape her keen interest in education, educating her patients so they are an informed part of their own healthcare team. Dr. Ishimaru attended medical school at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science in North Chicago, Illinois, and completed both her internship and residency at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center in Los Angeles. Respect for each individual's personal and cultural values is pivotal to the care she provides. She welcomes patients of all ages and provides comprehensive care for women's health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ishimaru. Thank you, Jane, for the um, warm introduction. I'm very honored to be here tonight talking to everyone about the very important topic of postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Thank you all for taking uh, time out of your busy schedules um, to learn about a topic that might one day apply to yourself, a family member, or perhaps a friend. So I'll move to um, the agenda. Um, I'd like to kind of start with an outline of where our topic will take us tonight. Um, we'll go over a few things like definitions and terminology so that we can all get on the same page and understand one another. Uh, next, we'll uh, touch on the causes of postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Um, but the most important part um, of this, or of my portion of the talk, would be to um, learn about what you should do if you have postmenopausal vaginal bleeding or what you might recommend to a friend if they um, tell you that they have some postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Um, after that, we will briefly touch on what tests might be considered for evaluation. And lastly, we'll uh, talk about a transition to Dr. Lin. Um, during that, I will discuss when it would be appropriate to consult with a GYN oncologist. So to move on, uh, let's discuss some medical terminology um, that we use when we're discussing postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. But uh, the first thing we really need to make sure that we're on common ground is that we all understand uh, what is the definition of um, postmenopausal. Uh, so postmenopausal also refers to a time period after menopause. Um, and the reason why this is important to understand the terminology is because the evaluation um, for bleeding is very different if the bleeding is occurring uh, after menopause or before menopause. 
So the definition of menopause is 12 months with no menses or spotting without another specific reason. Uh, so reasons for why a menses might not occur for 12 months could include a hysterectomy, which is a surgical removal of the uterus, treatment with medications such as Depo-Provera or Amirena IUD, which, is, which are both commonly used for contraception, but also have been used for treatment of heavy menses. And both of these do have a side effect of stopping menses in some patients. The average age of menopause in the United States is 51 years old, and about 95% of, of patients have gone through menopause by the age of 55. Menopause can occur before 40 years of age, but it is relatively uncommon. And the biological cause of menopause is a natural decrease in the produ production of the hormones estrogen and progesterone produced by the ovary. In contrast, perimenopausal is a transition um, period that occurs prior to menopause. It occurs actually during the reproductive years. The average age of onset for perimenopause is 47 years and typically begins approximately five years before menopause. During this time, menses may be irregular. Um, they could start to skip or conversely become more frequent. Perimenopause is also often, but not always, associated with other symptoms of low estrogen. Symptoms of low estrogen could include um, hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, or even potentially sleep disturbance. Uh, next, we'll look at a few uh, examples. Uh, so the first example is AR. Um, she is a 50-year-old um, woman with no medical problems, no prior surgeries, and not taking any medications, who's, um, um, and her last menstrual period was at the age of 50 years. So based on these, um, AR is menopausal. Uh, CM is a 40-year-old female who underwent a hysterectomy but has both ovaries at the age of 39 years old. Um, after not responding to other medical interventions for heavy menses. So in this case, because she had the hysterectomy as a reason um, for her not having a menses for 12 months, CM would not be considered menopausal. Um, and the final example is SA. She's a 46-year-old woman with irregular menses, hot flashes, and night sweats for the last six months after removal of a Mirena IUD. In the last four years of using the Mirena IUD, she had no menses or spotting. This again would be another example of a woman who had not had a period for 12 months, but it was related to the Mirena IUD. Um, and then she subsequently, after removal of that cause for the lack of menses, then resumes having menses, um, has other symptoms um, of low estrogen, and this would suggest that she is likely to be perimenopausal. So the next slide is regarding postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. So what is the definition of postmenopausal vaginal bleeding? Postmenopausal vaginal bleeding can be um, uh, any bleeding that occurs from the vagina that occurs again after menopause. It happens in about four to 11% of menopausal patients. And we can further describe the, the bleeding um, by these following characteristics. So first color, um, the color can be either pink red or brown. The amount can be described as scant. Uh, spotting, so very light. Um, it can be moderate bleeding or very heavy bleeding. And then the other characteristics are time frame. So this bleeding can occur continuously, meaning um, starting one day and, and doesn't stop, or can be episodic, meaning um, they, a woman might have um, some spotting um, and no spotting for several days, and then an episode of bleeding maybe a few days later or even a month later. Um, the associated symptoms um, with the bleeding can include um, being pain-free, meaning not having any pain at all, or could potentially include cramping or severe pain. Uh, the next slide um, will discuss some of the uh, causes for postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. And this, just to warn you, this slide will be very busy, um, and we'll try to talk through a few of the various causes. Um, the first um, category of reasons for postmenopausal vaginal bleeding would be structural. 
So um, the structural causes include endometrial polyps. These are polyps that are located inside the lining of the uterus. And polyps are also known as um, growths that occur within the lining. Uh, can be from a cervical polyp. Um, a cervical polyp is one that is located um, outside on the cervix um, and also another growth. Um, the following uh, would be uterine fibroids. So uterine fibroids are similar to polyps, but they are a little bit more of a, um, our origin is from the more of the muscle of the uterus. Um, the final two potential structural causes are atrophic vaginitis, which is um, thinning um, and dryness of the vaginal surface, um, most commonly seen in postmenopausal women. Um, and finally, trauma. So trauma can include things um, such as either um, uh, cuts or injuries from things like intercourse that is consensual or potentially even um, um, episodes of um, non-consensual intercourse. The next category of causes for postmenopausal vaginal bleeding include medications. So interestingly enough, um, hormone replacement therapy can cause postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Um, in general, we would tell patients that in the first six months of starting a hormone replacement therapy or a change in hor hormone replacement therapy, you may see some vaginal bleeding. Generally, any bleeding after that six month initiation would, would uh, need to be evaluated. It could still be related to the hormone replacement therapy, but is definitely something to be evaluated further if it goes on beyond the first six months of initiation. Um, anticoagulants such as Lovenox um, can cause, or heparin can cause vaginal bleeding as well as antiplatelet medications. So um, these are good to know about or good to tell your provider if you are taking them and experience vaginal bleeding. And then finally, herbal supplements uh, can cause um, uh, postmenopausal vaginal bleeding as well when taken typically in um, very high amounts. The next category includes infection. So yeast infections, genital tuberculosis, and sexually transmitted infections may all potentially cause postmenopausal vaginal bleeding um, and are always uh, something that we consider. Um, the next category are disease in nearby organs. So a bladder infection, also known as a UTI, or a urethral polyp. Um, so a polyp located instead of within one of the um, female organs that's coming out of the urethra these all potentially can cause postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. And sometimes it is actually very difficult to tell the, um, where the bleeding is coming from um, because all of the structures are located very close to one another. And then finally, a topic that I will leave a little bit more to Dr. Lynn to discuss, but um, of course, always on the minds of all, both our patients and ourselves is of course cancer. And there are several different types of cancer that can cause postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Um, the, the one that floats to the top, of course, is endometrial cancer, also known as uterine cancer. This is a uh, cancer of the lining of the uterus. There is also something called endometrial and endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, which um, for um, your providers is something that we would consider a precancerous um, uh, condition. There is also cervical cancer, uh, fallopian tube cancer, vaginal cancer, and vulvar cancer. And then lastly, there is um, something called post-radiation therapy um, that can cause postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. This would be seen in a woman who has received radiation therapy, typically for one of the um, above types of cancers, and then has bleeding related to um, the thinning and um, uh, very sensitive skin that results from the radiation. So importantly, what I um, have done with that slide is sort of thrown it out. It's obviously very, very complicated um, and involves a lot to know. Um, so I do want you to know that this next slide is probably the most important thing. This is what you need to know about postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Um, the reason why the slide was crumpled is because your um, provider, whether it's a gynecologist, a nurse practitioner in the gynecologist's office, um, or a physician assistant in the gynecologist's office, um, they will know all of those potential causes by heart. 
um, and they will be um, they will be the ones who are going to help you to figure out what is going on. You will definitely not need to come in um, with a idea of what is causing your vaginal bleeding, although we're um, always happy to hear if you've done your own research and you're um, you know have kind of narrowed it down. It's always very helpful. But this is what we would find to be very helpful in us helping you uh, to figure this out. So we want you to know that you're we're a team, um, and here is how you can help us to get the appropriate care. So the first thing is is knowing who to call. Um, so you can definitely call your general gynecologist if you already have them. I have one that would be your OBGYN. Um, we would recommend getting an appointment either this week or next week. Um, and in other words, ideally as soon as possible. Um, the, of course, you can also call your GYN oncologist or gynecologic oncologist if, there, if you have already had a personal history of gynecologic cancer. That is absolutely appropriate. Um, the next topic would be knowing when to go to the emergency room. So the reasons that you would go to the emergency room rather than calling your um, gynecologist in their office would be if you have excessive vaginal bleeding, if you have symptoms of anemia, such as dizziness, um, chest pain, shortness of breath, um, fatigue. Um, if you have severe pain associated with your, vaginal, your postmenopausal vaginal bleeding, it's another very good reason to go to the emergency room. And of course, if you have or have any fever or vomiting, those would be symptoms as well to go directly to the emergency room. And then the last thing would be knowing what information to provide to your uh, gynecologist when you talk to them or to the nurse practitioner or again, physician assistant. So the first thing would be, when did the bleeding start? Um, how much bleeding have you had? And if you can, is to describe that in terms of either the amounts that you've seen on a pad or perhaps how often you've had to change um, your underwear, that type of thing would be very helpful. Um, uh, we'd like you to bring a list of your medications. As we were talking about earlier, there are certain medications as well as herbal supplements that potentially could cause postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. And then of course, um, letting us know if there's been any recent trauma um, as well as any associated symptoms. Um, and then very importantly, um, if there's any family history of um, particular uh, conditions such as uterine, ovarian, or breast cancer, that's always very, very helpful. And on the next slide, we'll talk about some of the tests that might be considered as part of your evaluation. So importantly, the first part of the evaluation will always be done. A very thorough history is key to determining potential causes and the next steps. A physical exam is normally also done to evaluate for the amount of bleeding and the potential location of the bleeding. However, there may be certain situations where um, um, a um, abbreviated physical exam might be done. For example, in a woman who may not tolerate um, certain positions, then we do sometimes have to make modifications. Um, in general, you can expect a speculum exam as well as potentially um, a bimanual exam. Um, the next thing would be a blood, basic blood test that might be done if there is a high degree of suspicion of the bleeding could be causing anemia. So things like a complete blood count, or also known as a CBC, is a very reasonable blood test to do to check for anemia. Um, a further um, evaluation might include a pelvic ultrasound. This would be used to evaluate for structural causes such as fibroids or potentially polyps. The pelvic ultrasound is also used to evaluate the thickness of the lining of the uterus, also known as the endometrium. If the endometrium measures more than five millimeters in a menopausal woman, then there is a higher degree of suspicion for, for either endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, again, the precancer, or potentially endometrial cancer. And then a in-office endometrial biopsy may be considered um, this is a procedure on, um, during which a small sample of the lining of the uterus is taken, um, and it is a small tubing is placed inside the uterus in order to remove that sample. Um, um, lastly, a fractional DNC or a dilation and curettage might be performed. This would be a um, in um, either in the hospital or in a surgical center under anesthesia type of procedure. 
Um, this would be to get a further sampling of the lining of the uterus. And then finally, the hysteroscopy would also be a potential procedure or potential test that could be done. And this would be done again, also under anesthesia, either in a surgical operating room or at a surgery center. Um, all of these tests could either be done stepwise um, or potentially up, into, up until obviously the ones involving anesthesia um, on the same day that you're seen in the office. And most of what determines um, whether it's done in a stepwise fashion or if it's done um, all on the same day really depends on both the characteristics of the type of bleeding, the amount of bleeding, as well as patient preference, um, as well as um, the, the physician pre preference as well. So the next steps, when would a gynecologic on oncology um, consultation be appropriate? So a di so the first one, first situation would be if a diagnosis diagnosis of a gynecologic cancer is determined by the results from your initial evaluation. That would be a very appropriate time for a gynecologic oncology um, consultation. Um, there are also the possibility uh, in cases of endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, again, the precancerous um, diagnosis. This would depend upon your general gynecologist and your um, personal opinions on whether it's appropriate for the consultation. There is also a situation where there may be challenging surgical management um, is expected based on either the um, patient history or on previous surgeries. This would be also another situation where it's appropriate to obtain a gynecologic oncology consultation. And then finally, there's always the other reasons that either your general gynecologist might feel that it's more appropriate, you would uh, be more appropriate to have better care with a gynecologic oncologist. So importantly, your gynecologist will always provide a handoff with pertinent information and the results to the gyneco gynecologic oncologist. And this would be the time that I will now hand it off to Dr. Lin. Thank you so much, Dr. Ishimaro. That was a very informative presentation. I love the fact that um, we're able to um, start off with um, this discussion so we can um, now go to um, um, introduce Dr. Dr. Lin. Um, Dr. Lin is a board certified gynecologic um, oncologist who completed his residency at Cornell and fellowship at University of Pittsburgh and has been in practice for more than seven years. He is passionate about bringing the cutting edge of gynecologic oncology, such as HIPEC, hyperthermic interperitoneal chemotherapy to the bedside in a personalized setting. Dr. Lin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hopefully I won't uh, do the sh screen sharing incorrectly. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody can see things. Um, so thank you to Dr. Ishimaru for the handoff and the comprehensive overview. Um, just uh, I, as a gynecologic oncologist, I know this is a community lecture, so I don't want to get into too much the esoterics of GYN cancer. And so I was thinking that we would do more of a deep dive into the various, into the causes of postmenopausal bleeding, which Dr. Ishmaru had gone over. Um, but in terms of like doing the deep dive, we hopefully will drive more understanding and try to answer some of the questions in the back of our minds, but are, you know, but we may be afraid to ask things like, should you be worried when postmenopausal bleeding happens? Where is that blood actually coming from? Surprise, surprise. It's not always, you know, where one thinks. Um, the black box that is hormones, just like supply chain crisis that we see in the, around the country, we tend to blame a lot of things on hormones. But we'd like to go a little bit more behind the scenes on how the hormones, estrogen and progesterone that were mentioned, actually affect bleeding. Then we'll go into a bit more detail on some of the initial testing, kind of the nitty gritty of what to expect. Um, uh, um, it, of the test that Dr. Ishmaru mentioned and to demystify, you know, what to expect and things that, you know, when you're at the appointment. Finally, we'll go over a few considerations when it comes to uh, postmenopausal bleeding that are for special circumstances and cases. 
to this day, it kind of blows my mind that the definition of menopause is retrospective and by symptoms rather than by a blood test or some kind of advanced imaging test of some sort. And this is especially the case because in the perimenopausal period, there is often irregular and heavy bleeding. So, you know, it's it, even the most regular of um, uh, patients with the most regular periods oftentimes will start to experience irregular periods. And, you know, this is also at a time when, you know, most of, you know, most patients are expecting the periods to be kind of fading into the sunset, kind of easing and just kind of going away. But, you know, the irregularity and the heaviness, like why, right? Um, the way I like to think of it is that the perimenopausal body, it's kind of like a car that's running a little bit low on fuel, all right? So the, in this analogy, the driver is the brain, the engine is the ovaries, and the movement is estrogen. When the fuel indicator starts to dip low, the brain senses that decreased estrogen, and the driver's instinct is to step harder on the accelerator um, to compensate, right? The brain sends this higher level uh, hormone called FSH to tell the ovaries to increase estrogen production. The ovaries being low on fuel puts out as much as it can, but it, you know, it's not adequate sometimes. So what you end up seeing is the car will speed up, then the, uh, the power cuts a little bit and then gets more juice again, sputters on and on and, you know, goes faster, slower, et cetera, until the ovaries are completely out of fuel. And that's kind of what is going on um, in the perimenopausal period. This is a little bit easier to understand than a chart like this I would study in medical school. Um, the estrogen levels are relatively stable through the reproductive years, then starts to drift down, and then you'll see the FSH, that driver hormone, try to bring it back up with limited and then eventually no success towards the end of the perimenopausal period into menopause. Um, all that being said, this irregular bleeding can make it difficult to track the final period. There are some hormone tests, such as the FSH and, hormone, uh, and estrogen itself, that can be obtained, but they're often inconclusive in this period, and they by no means define menopause. As Dr. Ishimura mentioned, the postmenopausal bleeding is defined as bleeding after 12 months of not having a period or not having a bleeding. There is also an additional backstop of the age of 55 years, beyond which statistically, the, um, any sort of additional bleeding that's coming from the uterus is unlikely to be a period and should be investigated. Even if one has all the symptoms of a period, ovulation pain, PMS, cramping, the works, even if it comes after vigorous exercise, even if one has been under a lot of stress, any of those things, and I've, we've heard them all, it should still be investigated um, rather than not. The good thing is that for the majority of the time, the cause is benign and it's not cancer or precancer, the hyperplasia or intra, um, uh, and the, uh, endometrial intrapathial neoplasia, as Dr. Schmer mentioned. And, you know, kind of, this is kind of the main takeaway message, I think, from both uh, sides of this talk, which is that if you, your relatives, your girlfriends, your neighbors, even people you hate, right, experience bleeding after 12 months of not having periods or having periods, quote unquote, past the age of 60 or 55, sorry about that, please calmly right, but certainly make an appointment to your friendly local neighborhood women's care provider to get it checked out. You know, it doesn't have to be like a mad rush necessarily, um, because most of the time it will be benign, but it is definitely something where you want to, you know, you want to get checked out, you want to move with alacrity. Okay, so what is actually going on with postmenopausal bleeding? Right? I want to do a quick review of the relevant anatomy of where that blood or that, that brownish pinkish spot that you see on the underwear or the toilet paper or in the toilet might be coming from. Well, we refer to postmenopausal bleeding as being due to the uterus or the vagina, like postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. About 10% of the time, it's actually from something else, um, which Dr. Ishmael had also mentioned. Um, the vulva, which is the area shaded here in green, is the outside of the genital tract. And after menopause with low estrogen, there could be atrophy, dryness, trauma, as was mentioned, precancerous changes of the vulva, and even vulvar cancer that can all bleed. It's not always clear that the bleeding is actually coming from the outside 
Um, and uh, so it's, it's sometimes it can be difficult to tell. It's not a common thing to do, unlike say, you know, how we in the past have recommended um, like self breast exams and things like that. But I often actually do recommend folks take a hand mirror at least once, but you know, especially like if there's more issues or other things before, take a hand mirror, put it down and kind of take a look to kind of get familiar, so familiarize ourselves with the vulva. Um, that way you kind of know what it kind of your own vulva looks like and you know, to know any changes. Another surprising source of bleeding is the urethra, um, urethral caruncle or polyp. As Dr. Shimura mentioned, you know, like a benign fleshy polyp that uh, can bleed from movement or being scraped against by the underwear. Yet another cause is the GI tract, right, from like a hemorrhoid or an anal fissure. I've had a, I've had patients that swear up and down that the location of the blood based on where the toilet paper was, it's got to be vaginal, got to be vaginal. When we, you know, on exam, on careful exam, we can actually see that, you know, the vagina is totally, there's no source of bleeding and there is a clear hemorrhoid. Um, but especially for my oncology patients, I'd rather do a hundred exams that are easy explanations rather than miss like a vaginal tumor or a vaginal lesion, vaginal ulcer, et cetera. So um, all of this is really to kind of say that it's not always easy to be exactly sure where a small amount of blood or any amount of blood, to be fair, uh, it's coming from. And a careful exam is super duper important in the evaluation. Right. Moving inwards, right, going more towards the inside. Um, the uh, postmenopausal bleeding can also be due to vaginal atrophy or dryness. The inside of the vagina is lined with uh, epithelium, which are surface cells. Just like the skin on the outside on the vulva, they also become dry and thin uh, with the decrease in estrogen and menopause. They can crack and chafe and bleed and also um, become more susceptible to trauma. Another possible source as mentioned also is the cervix, the door between the uterus and the vagina, um, here in, also in green, uh, in the form of cervical polyps or cancer. Finally, we actually reach the endometrium, which is the, again, the inside lining of the uterus, which is where a baby or a fetus would have been in the, you know, way back in the, in the day, right? This tissue is the culprit of 90% of postmenopausal bleeding. 80 to 90% of the bleeding from inside the uterus from the endometrium is due to a benign finding, such as, as mentioned, was atrophy. A normal finding, which is that it's actually still doing its normal menstrual duties, um, a polyp or fibroid being the most common benign causes. The other 10 to 20% of the time is due to hyperplasia slash EIN or cancer, All right? Again, we don't, not, you know, I'm not planning on doing too, too, going too, too deep into endometrial cancer, um, but as a general oncologist, I do want to pass along a few points of trivia. <laughs> um, it is the most common um, cancer of the female genital tract in the United States, occurring in two to three percent of all women with increasing incidence. A key caveat of this is that it's in the U.S. because this is not the case in countries like China, like India, Sub-Saharan Africa. It's really U.S., U.K., and developing countries or developed countries. This has to do with the incidence of obesity in the United States, which increases the risk of endometrial cancer by 30x, okay? Just in comparison, smoking increases the risk of lung cancer by 10 to 20x. Obesity increases the risk of endometrial cancer by 30x, okay? The reason is actually due to the next part, which is hormones, which is why I wanted to do a deep dive because it's very interesting to be able to tie it all together. So there are two main hormones that affect and control the uterus and the menstrual cycle and even the postmenopausal setting, estrogen and progesterone. Behind the scenes, um, this is kind of how I like to kind of uh, conceptualize things. Estrogen represented by this orange red brick layer as well as the brick uh, elevator um, and the um, progesterone, which is represented by the yellow mortar that is there to kind of stick things, basically is building and stabilizing a wall. That is the endometrium, right? 
um, and the individual little endometrial cells are kind of represented by the fleshy pink uh, bricks of, uh, that are in this cartoon. Before menopause, so we'll kind of start with before menopause and then go into uh, the special circumstances. During the first half of the menstrual cycle, there is coordination between the two hormones to kind of build a sizable wall, right? And then a lot of estrogen is released after ovulation to really kind of make sure things are things are held down tight um, and be ready for a fertilized embryo if there is one um, to make it a comfy home for it to land inside the uterus. If no fertilized embryo comes, then at the end of the cycle, everything stops and a hurricane of uterine contractions and cramping wipes out the entire you know, house or wall. And that's what, a, you know, a menstrual period. With hormone and uterine related postmenopausal or abnormal uterine bleeding, there is a mismatch of the bricks to the mortar. Okay. Remember in the perimenopausal period, the brain is sending high levels of this FSH signal to make more estrogen, which the ovary initially and at times can do. So essentially it's kind of like having more workers and more bricklaying machines running around on the bricklaying side of things, but kind of in chaos and not always in coordination, right? So sometimes, you know, more bricks are laid than there are motor to actually stick things. Getting a little ahead of myself here. In the case of uterine polyp, hyperplasia and endometrial cancer, it's usually due to excess estrogen. So this brings back to the point of the obesity being at such a, being such a prominent risk factor. So patients who are obese, um, the estrogen that is seen in their, you know, endometrial hyperplasia, or that's driving their endometrial hyperplasia or cancer isn't actually coming from the ovaries. They're being converted from other hormones, adrenal hormones, testosterone, um, and other, other hormones into estrogen by an enzyme in all of our fat cells. Um, this enzyme is called aromatase. All of us have it. Um, and the more fat or adipose tissue there is, the more of this enzyme there is. So even in men, there is this tissue. So such that in men, the you know, for obese guys, man boobs are actually breast tissue that are stimulated by the extra estrogen that's being produced. Okay. The extra, so back to our analogy here, the extra estrogen, um, you know, workers and brick elevators are, are essentially kind of they're they're not following the plans of, of how things are of building a house. It's not that, you know, they're just kind of building the house as, as according to plan. With polyps are kind of just adding a separate wall somewhere else. That's not where we're expecting it to be. With hyperplasia, it's as if the, the workers are kind of really kind of not very smart and the machines are just running high speed, breaking some of the bricks. They're, they're just under the microscope, the cells look abnormal. With cancer, it's as if the workers themselves are evil essentially and the machines are going bonkers and you can't control them anymore and there's the, the it's throwing bricks all over the place and it's it's going beyond where your lot would be and it's metastasizing okay so with any of these things again irregular hormones and endometrial polyp and endometrial hyperplasia cancer the walls that are built are really just not sturdy right it's not a brick mortar brick and so what happens is you get a partial collapse of that wall you know, when the bricks aren't held in place. And when you have that collapse of those cells, that leads to the bleeding and potentially the cramping. So this is a much more scientific cartoon of this. Um, the stuff shaded in red, the estrogen or this weak estrogen from the, uh, that it's coming or being converted within the adipose tissue, scientific work for fat. Um, tamoxifen, which we'll talk about in a bit, and also exogenous estrogen, such as hormone replacement, they're all stimulating endometrial growths, uh, growth and can are adding bricks that can topple over. And the other effect would be if there's less progesterone, the things that are shaded in yellow, uh, which would mean that there's less mortar to hold the bricks together. So this could be a decrease in ovarian production of progesterone in the perimenopausal period or things like an ovulation. Because remember, it's ovulation that triggers the extra release of the progesterone to kind of stabilize the endometrium in cases like polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, so this, in a nutshell, is kind of how it works behind the scenes. It's confusing, but you know, it's still a little bit better than how we memorize it in medical school. We want to look at a bunch of squiggly lines like this and try to correlate and piece together how the hormone works 
in the menstrual cycle and beyond. So during medical school residency, it was still uh, kind of afraid or ashamed to say it, but still, still tricky. Right. So before we sort of leave this topic, though, I want to reiterate estrogen is like a brick layer, progesterone is like mortar. There's an imbalance, the bricks can topple. And when the bricks topple, it's abnormal bleeding. Okay. So kind of take a bit of a turn here, go over kind of what to expect when, you know, you go to the, the provider with postmenopausal bleeding, kind of really more in detail of what it, what it is, right? So given what we talked about previously, Obviously, a uh, thorough pelvic exam is key to determine where it's actually coming from, right? 90% of the time, we know it's coming from vagina or the uterus, but it's still possible to be something else. You don't want to be, you know, missing that. Um, if the bleeding is coming from a cervical lesion, sometimes a pap smear can be done. The reason I put it in a question mark is that pap smear is a screening test, whereas a biopsy, which we'll get to in a bit, is the actual diagnostic test. So pap smear um, is just scraping of the loose cells that are on and uh, around or inside the cervix. Um, with cervical cancer and precancer, the cells look increasingly abnormal as they become cancerous. And so they, you know, we can kind of correlate the cells that are kind of just hanging around on the cervix and see, does it look like, you know, um, that they're about to turn cancerous. Um, but uh, if there's any, you know, when on exam, we put the speculum in, we're taking a look. If there's anything that looks abnormal, usually we end up going directly towards the cervical biopsy, which is kind of the picture on the right here. Um, basically, that gets us kind of a, a punch biopsy of the tissue, the, you know, the abnormal tissue and also stuff underneath, right? Because the de very definition of cancer is something that goes underneath, kind of invades through the basement membrane invades into areas where it shouldn't be and can uh, start to metastasize or spread. So now if we're looking at just the uterus, which is the bulk of the time, we usually use an ultrasound. Ultrasound is a way to look inside the uterus to see if there's a buildup of the tissue, the extra bricks or even blood from a previous analogy. Um, and, you know, there's kind of two ways to do it. This is a transabdominal ultrasound, which is, you know, something that one might be familiar with from pregnancy, especially later parts of pregnancy. But as you can see, the probe is on top of the stomach. So it's going through, you know, has to kind of go through bow and appendix here, even you can see, um, before it can actually get to see the uterus and the ovaries. Um, the other ultrasound technique is transvaginal. So like uh, something that you may have uh, seen or experienced in early pregnancy or um, other times. Um, the, that the transvaginal ultrasound probe is applied directly against the cervix and it's much closer to the uterus than the transabdominal probes are and get, get us better and clearer images. Um, if there is nothing in the endometrial cavity, the endometrium looks like a deflated balloon because it's a potential cavity. It doesn't all, you know, the, the, the edges could, would be basically close and right next to each other. But there's extra stuff, whether it's polyp, blood, or cancer, the, that potential cavity is filled up with that stuff and the ultrasound looks thickened. It's actually kind of interesting, but in this cartoon, the, it's uh, that the um, endometrial stripe or the endometrial cavity actually does look a bit thickened. So if we do see extra stuff inside the uterus or there's active bleeding or some sort of tissue that's coming out of the cervix when we put the speculum in, usually we'll proceed with an endometrial biopsy. So it sounds scary, but it's actually less sort of less invasive, less of a um, kind of procedure than the cervical or vulvar biopsies. We basically put like this thin little flexible plastic straw into the uterus and pull back on the plunger to create a small amount of suction, pull out whatever tissue that kind of, that is in the uterus that, that comes into that plunger. Um, it's mechanically kind of like getting uh, like a jump started period. Um, certainly there are folks that really, you know, have a tough time with this. Um, but in general, it is uh, outpatient procedure. Most patients are able to tolerate it. But certainly, you know, if it's too uncomfortable, let your provider know there's no reason to suffer through it if you don't. A pro tip would be, you know, taking an NSAID like ibuprofen or naproxen, a leave before these procedures can help uh, with the cramping, but definitely check with your provider first. 
So um, as uh, Dr. Schmidt also mentioned, if an endometrial biopsy can't be done or is non-diagnostic, or there's concern of a focal lesion, right? Because the endometrial biopsy is kind of a blind procedure. We're not actually able to say specifically look at this polyp here and try to you know, have a good chance of sampling it. We'll proceed with a DNC, um, which is dilation of the cervix and curatage or scraping of the endometrial cavity with larger instruments and or hysteroscopy, which is the camera inside the, the uterus, inside the endometrial cavity. This again is done in the operating room, uses an outpatient procedure because you, you, know, you don't want to be awake when those instruments are there um, for your safety um, and comfort. So this is the gamut of diagnostic testing that might be used to investigate and kind of the actual pictures and, and things like that themselves. Um, and again, you know, they are mostly either part of the routine exam or minor procedures. And hopefully that takes away some of the unknowns and kind of gets actual, you know, pictures of and kind of the idea of what will actually happen, you know, um, when there's uh, postmenopausal bleeding. It's not always like a crazy painful biopsy or something like that. Um, you know, we, we do truly want folks to not be afraid to, to come in for an evaluation. As we're winding down, this is kind of a potpourri slide of special considerations and postmenopausal bleeding. Tamoxifen is a drug that is given to treat and uh, prevent breast cancer recurrence because it acts again as a uh, antagonist or blocker of estrogen on the breast tissue and ER positive breast cancer cells. But interestingly, it acts as an agonist or a mimic of estrogen on the uterus itself. So, you know, it's, it's as if, um, you know, it acts like an estrogen, kind of acts like one of the red-orange workers, uh, the bricklayers, and they can cause more buildup of endometrium, endometrial tissue, and can make patients more prone to postmenopausal bleeding and also endometrial cancer. Um, so, you know, postmenopausal bleeding related to endometrial cancer, or sorry, related to tamoxifen is actually a little bit tricky because unlike cases of hormone replacement, um, where extra estrogen can be balanced out by putting, getting more progesterone or more, um, you know, mortar, um, patients with hormone uh, positive or sensitive breast cancer, you really should not be getting that progesterone usually because that can actually drive down the uh, breast cancer. So for patients on tamoxifen, if there is endometrial thickening or endometrial um, or postmenopausal bleeding, a lot of times we just, we stay vigilant. We do biopsies to make sure there's not an evolution of that thickening into cancer. Um, but uh, most of the time we can just stay vigilant. Another class of drugs in breast cancer um, that are used for similar reasons as tamoxifen are aromatase inhibitors. Kind of went through it quickly, but aromatase, again, is that enzyme in our fat cells and other cells that convert regular hormones into estrogen. So you may know these drugs as, you know, Arimidex or Nastrozole, Fumara or Letrozole, Aromacin or Eximestane. They block that, the, that, those enzymes, right? So they take away estrogen. So unlike tamoxifen, which acts as an agonist at the endometrium, these drugs usually kind of, they're not associated with uh, endometrial thickening or postmenopausal bleeding, but they can, you know, still be associated with bleeding that's associated with atrophy or again, that thinning of anywhere, in, you know, whether it's endometrium, vagina, or the ball, okay? A lot of patients ask about hormone replacement therapy and menopause, and there's a lot of nuances and details, but in general, there isn't, you know, one, one of the questions we'll always get is, you know, if one goes into menopause, whether surgically or naturally, it, you know, does that mean I need estrogen? Does that mean I need hormone replacement? But in general, there isn't really a recommendation or requirement that all postmenopausal patients um, need or should get HRT, right? We studied this back in the 90s with the Women's Health Initiative, um, because at the time it was thought that giving hormones, especially estrogen, would relieve not just would not just relieve menopausal symptoms, but also increase overall health. But they found that HRT was actually harmful, right? They increased the risk of blood clots, heart attack, stroke and there's an association with breast cancer. It's, it's mostly, you know, especially when it's a combined estrogen with progesterone and the progesterone seems to be the bad actor here. 
Um, but we don't, you know, we would definitely not want to give just estrogen because then you're potentially jumpstarting an endometrial cancer in a patient who, who has a uterus. Um, but regardless, based on those findings, we nowadays really kind of limit HRT to patients with symptoms severe enough that the benefits outweigh the risks on balance. Okay, finally, blood thinners. This was also mentioned uh, by Dr. Ishimaru. So say for like atrial fibrillation or heart attack or stroke prevention can also be associated with bleeding in general. So please make sure that when you, you know, go see your provider, um, that your medication history is up to date, because um, that also can affect, you know, our biopsy, you know, how, how aggressive we were going with the biopsy and things like that. Okay, so that is sort of my last slide. But so please remember, number one, get evaluated for postmenopausal bleeding. Number two, that the postmenopausal, the perimenopausal period can be very regular because the hormones are a little bit wonky. Remember the, the gas, right? Um, and three, the mismatch between the estrogen brick layers and the progesterone mortars account for most caught cases of postmenopausal bleeding. And honestly, a lot of the abnormal uterine bleeding that we uh, see. Um, so hopefully this deep dive was helpful and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lin. That was an excellent presentation from both of our physicians, Dr. Ishimaru and Dr. Lin. Really appreciate it. Very informative. So I, I just want to reassure everybody that um, you're, in the, in the Q&A, when you ask your questions, it's private. We're the only ones that see it. I understand the sensitivity of our topic this evening. So be reassured we're the only ones that see it. But before we begin our Q&A, we have a few questions for you. If you could please answer the poll that you see appear on your screen and give us your feedback, um, that would be highly, highly appreciated. Um, we want to make it better, and um, we will go ahead and begin our Q&A. Feel free to continue to ask questions, OK? All right. So. So this is a very good question. I thought that was very timely. Um, and Dr. Lin, Dr. Ishimaru, feel free to respond. What can you say on, on menopausal bleeding due to COVID? Is there such a thing? I know COVID being new, um, this is probably controversial, but um, have you encountered this or there, is this such a, a thing right now with COVID and, and menopausal bleeding? Um, it's a great question, Jane. I can take that one first, and then, of course, also pass it on to Dr. Lin. Um, so we do, we do actually get this question often. And what I would tell patients is true is that COVID is very new. COVID vaccines are obviously very new as well. Um, but importantly, I would always err on the side of caution and get evaluated. Um, personally, I would still um, complete the entire evaluation as if the vaginal bleeding happened with or without um, either a COVID um, infection or without the vaccine. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, COVID by itself isn't going to increase or bleeding potential or anything like that. We don't know it affecting the virus more than anything else. Um, if anything, we know that it causes more time. So that's actually inconsistency of you know, bleeding. Versus, yeah, so definitely would recommend evaluation. All right, so we have another question. Thank you. Keep the questions coming, everyone. Um, so if, is it possible to have bleeding and not determine the cause? So for example, you've had diagnostic procedures. Um, there's still light spotting that still occurs. To not know the cause, I would say to, to not know where it's coming from would be more of a problem because we should always know kind of where it's coming from. Um, but in terms of, you know, some, I definitely have patients that either myself I've worked up or I've been referred where, you know, it's, we know it's coming from the uterus, but we don't know exactly why or that, you know, it could be from atrophy or something. There's not a great explanation of where that bleeding from inside the uterus is coming from. Um, 
And at that point, it's a matter of, you know, okay, when do we need to reevaluate? And is it something that's. Dr. Lin, it sounds like your audio is a little bit off. There's some garbling, so I just want to bring that to your attention. I do not change anything. Is this still, still pretty difficult to hear? Mm -hmm. So you want me to proceed? We'll have another question. Let me try to switch to uh, that side. Are you able to hear me now? Much better. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That's why I have all this stuff on back up. Like you can't see it. <laughs> high tech, high here. tech, Dr. Lin. Right. <laughs> Um, so what I was mentioning was that, you know, we should at least kind of know where the bleeding is coming from. There are certainly some causes of the like uterine bleeding that we don't always have a great explanation for. Sometimes we chalk it up to atrophy or something like that, where, you know, the bleeding, you know, we do everything that we can, but you can we still have some bleeding. At that point, then is the question between you and your provider of, you know, when to, um, you know, potentially reevaluate if there's anything cha that changes and or looking at more definitive options of treating uh, bleeding. Great, thank you. So another question is, is there a relationship between um, hormone replacement therapy and osteoporosis that you know of? Um, so I, that's a great question. Um, I can take that one. Um, I, I do believe maybe the question is regarding um, use of hormone replacement therapy, does it reduce the incidence of osteoporosis? And, mm -hmm. and it does. So that is one of the benefits of using hormone replacement therapy is that there is um, some osteoporosis prevention as well as slowing of the bone loss that can occur with um, hormone replacement therapy. But it, it alone is probably not um, entirely like um, a 100% great reason to use hormone replacement therapy. Um, each individual patient should probably be evaluated in terms of risks and benefits for the use of hormone replacement therapy. Um, it's not something I would recommend as a, a blanket statement for all women to prevent osteoporosis, but much more of a discussion on a one-to-one -one basis with your provider. Thank you, Dr. Ishimara. So I have another question here about um, postmenopausal bleeding rather, and when does it start? So if you take supplements, for example, vitamins or what, what have you, um, does postmenopausal bleeding start after that or when you take supplements? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I think we still, you know, with supplements, especially there's different um, sort of quality and, you know, with with supplements, unlike, you know, medications or hormones specifically, it's the dosage may not always be sort of standardized, um, sort of batch to batch or even pill to pill. Um, so it's a little bit trickier, but certainly, you know, um, you know, a lot of patients, you know, I've had patients who come in um, after years of what should, what is really truly in retrospect, postmenopausal bleeding, um, that thought, you know, because they were taking various supplements or vitamins, or they had some sort of lifestyle change, which are all very commendable, but they thought that those really kind of rejuvenated their system. And that's why they're having periods again. It's like, it's like, you know, turning back the clock. Um, and that actually was not the case, unfortunately. Um, if there's any sort of question um you know if it's something where where you really do suspect that it is you know associated with the medications you know sometimes you save it with your next routine appointment with your um gynecology provider um but you know it's something where um you know postmenopausal bleeding by the by the definition um really kind of should be evaluated i don't know if dr schmidt is uh different you know, I would agree. Um, it's always best to err on the side of caution and get evaluated and discuss it with your provider. Um, that's there's never there's never any harm done by just discussing it. 
And I think this is our one last question here. I think you you mentioned it, Dr. Ishimara, but we just want to make sure um, that the hasn't the COVID vaccine created more cases of postmenopausal bleeding? It's a great question. I'm actually not aware of any particular studies. Um, I'm sure that they, these studies will um, be conducted and ongoing, but as far as I'm aware, I'm not aware of any particular um, medical studies that show that there's an actual causal relationship between the vaccine and postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Um, what we do know is that um, there is uh, some data regarding women who are premenopausal, meaning um, uh, actually, uh, you know, again, before the 12 months have, have occurred where they haven't had a period um, and how it can affect their menses. Um, and this is something that, uh, as you know, gynecologists, we discuss a lot in our meetings. Um, and, you know, any introduction of a new stress um, can potentially cause some irregularity to bleeding, but this is typically not an ongoing long-term type of effect. Um, just as in college uh, students, um, if they're uh, studying for finals, the stress of studying for finals can sometimes temporarily cause some menstrual irregularities. But again, once that stress is gone, um, their menses usually get back to normal. So whether you're premenopausal or postmenopausal, if you experience um, you know, irregularities and, and bleeding. And again, with postmenopausal women, if you experience any bleeding, you really should discuss it with your provider. Great. Yeah, and, and yeah, go ahead, so, Dr. Sorry, Lee. And also, again, remember, most of the time, any of the evaluations is going to lead, you know, we're going to have a benign finding, right? But it's really, we're trying to catch and prevent that 10% or so of patients that end up having something where delay of diagnosis could lead to a higher stage sort of cancer or something that we could have treated but didn't get to, right? So instead of, you know, I, I like to think of it as, you know, if there's a sign, then, you know, you, you, you know, go past go, collect $200 or whatever, you kind of mm -hmm. go to where it is um, instead of, you know, kind of think of all the different potential reasons that it could be. Let, uh, let your provider be the one to think about the, the, all the different reasons that it can or can't be, or, mm -hmm. you know, not saying that you shouldn't, but, but kind of do, do the work up. And the, the whole reason we kind of, or at least I wanted to kind of, de, you know, show you the pictures of what the things look, you know, what all the evaluations look like and everything is to kind of demystify it. It is not something where you're going, and it's not like you're going to go into the to the office and come out without a uterus or something like that. You know, we're mm -hmm. looking to do some mm -hmm. sort of evaluation to make sure you're okay. And that's all we're right. trying to do. I, you know, maybe at the end of the day, yeah, we'll say, you know, we have no other reason than, you know, you got the vaccine or something like that, or you got COVID or something like that. But at least we've done the workup to make sure you are okay. All right, great. And as you are talking about that workup, how long should we wait before we schedule an appointment? for postmenopausal bleeding. Yeah, so I've seen it on, on sort of both sides, right? Like I've had patients, like I mentioned, who for years thought they were just rejuvenated and, you know, became a young woman again and having regular periods every month, but uh, turned out to be from something else. Uh, took a year or more to get evaluated, which is uh, can't be too late. Um, and then I've also had patients where, you know, they had a little bit, just a ble uh, an episode of bleeding and they're coming into my, you know, our office thinking, oh my gosh, I, I read on Google, this is cancer, this is endometrial cancer until proven otherwise. I want my uterus out. I want the radiation to start tomorrow. There, it's got to be something in between that. Um, and that's why in my talk, I mentioned, you know, it's something where, you know, you want to get the evaluation sort of calmly, but, you know, certainly you want to get the evaluation. So, you know, call the office um, or, you know, get the referral, whether from your primary care doctor or something like that, if you do not already have a women's health uh, provider um, to get in for an evaluation. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Lin. Th thank you, Dr. Ishimaru. And thank you, everyone who um, joined and for taking the time to listen and ask questions. And a big thanks again to Dr. Ishimaru and Dr. Lin for taking the time to provide us with valuable information. We will be sending a recording of the presentation to all attendees for you to have. We'll also be posting this on our Facebook page for everyone to be able to view and share. You can find us at, at Little Company of Mary South Bay on Facebook. Again, 
at the Little Company of Mary South Bay. For any additional information or to schedule a physician appointment, please call our Patient Engagement Center at 1-888-925-0942. Again, 1-888-925-0942. Thank you again and have a great, great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.